the high Cairngorms, the rugged backbone of northern Britain, a place devoid of people, one of the last wildernesses left in Europe. I think that man evolved in a wild country. There is some need in mankind for this kind of thing. The recognition of wildness is important. It takes a special kind of person to be at home here. Adam Watson is a product of these hills. He's been shaped and made aware by them. I'm hooked on it and I like it. And I get inspiration from it. And I feel, not only I enjoy it, but I feel a great humility about being in, in these places. Dr. Watson is a research scientist and knows the Cairngorms better than any man living. His academic reputation in ecology has all been won outside the lecture room. He insisted from the beginning on being given his freedom, and that meant the freedom of these hills. I came to see him during one of the wettest weeks in one of the wettest summers on record. I wanted to discover what obsessions and conflicts raged under the impassive exterior of this unusual academic, who was also a hill man, a Gaelic scholar and a fierce Scottish patriot. I found him guarded by his dogs at the end of a narrow lane in the foothills of his beloved Cairngorms. It was on a drenching day like this that Adam, as a young boy of nine, first read the book that was to give him inspiration. It was called The Cairngorm Hills of Scotland. It's written by Seton Gordon, who was a great Scottish naturalist and author and wrote many books about the Highlands. And uh, this is the book, really, that changed my life, because up till that time I'd had a... What I remember was just a fairly ordinary life. But from that moment onwards, when I opened this book, I saw the world in a completely new way. And I wanted to go and see these Cairngorm hills that he wrote about so beautifully. He had a, a gift of writing very simply and beautifully about uh, sunsets or snow or whatever. And although he had an otherworldly, old-fashioned style, it's still very attractive today. And I'll give you an example of the thing. There's a wee piece of verse near the front of the book that attracted me particularly. May your heart keep true to the peaks above. May your feet be sure on the hills you love. May the summer mist and the winter storms never hide your path to the high Cairngorms. I can remember that struck me as soon as I opened the book. But then as I went into it in more detail, I saw a, a wonderland a new um, world that I hadn't really experienced. And uh, I've fell in love with it. It's the only word I can use to describe it. And have been in love with it ever since. When I went home, I plucked up courage and decided to write to him. And I have the letter here. It was written on the 15th of October, 1939, from Tariff in Aberdeenshire. And dear Mr. Seaton Gordon, I would like to go through the Larry Groove from Aviemore to Braemar, which is 22 and a half miles, but I have never done it. I have never seen a golden eagle. I wear a kilt. I am getting your book, The Cairngorm Hills of Scotland, for my birthday. I would like very much to climb Loch Nagar. I am only nine years old. Do you think I will manage? I would be very happy if I could claim it from Adam Watson. Why did you write to Seton Gordon? I felt a really burning desire to write to the man that had changed my life for that book. 
I didn't think he would reply. I thought he would be a very busy man and wouldn't be bothered with a letter from a small child. But I wanted to write it anyway. And he replied to you? He replied uh, a week later with this letter here. And I can remember the incredible excitement of getting this uh, envelope from the Isle of Skye. October the 22nd. Dear Adam, I was very glad to see your nicely written letter and the interesting pictures you drew. It's a fine thing for you to have a love of the hills, because on the hills you find yourself near grand and beautiful things, and as you grow older you will love them more. big river like the Dee is lower down. You must write to me again. I'm sending you two photographs. Your friend, Seton Gordon. And once I started going to the hills, I would uh, tell him things I'd seen, because he loved the Cairngorms too, but he was living in Skye, and I would draw the snow patches in the hills in summertime and keep him informed about his old stamping grounds. Adam Watson has now taken on Seton Gordon's mantle and has devoted his life to studying two of Scotland's less glamorous indigenous hill birds, the grouse and the ptarmigan, both finding survival increasingly difficult. An important part of Adam's work in summer is counting the birds and their chicks. The ptarmigan is notoriously difficult to spot. But you see, there's one over there. There's a hen. Oh, yes. Just, oh, she's so camouflaged, yeah, isn't just, she? Just like a stone. This time of year, when they have chicks, they sit still when they see danger coming and don't move. And unless you see the movement, uh, they're just extremely well camouflaged. Absolutely motionless. She's a good little bird, isn't she? Yes, She's obviously yes. protecting the, the young. How rare are they? Well, they're quite common in the hills here. Um, the Cairngorms and the hills around Bay Mar are a good place for them. And in fact, the numbers are quite high this year on this hill. Now, you see, you begin to see her. I mean, she's just sitting in that mixture of dwarf heather and the bright greens, the blaberry leaves. Yes. But you see a beautifully speckled plumage. Have you always got as close as this to these, these birds? Seldom you get quite so close as this, because I mean, she's obviously a very tight sitter. Yeah, there's another two. See, she's off with them. In the end, I think I would leave the ptarmigan with a feeling of respect and humility because it's, it lives here. I mean, we only come now and again when the weather's good and we've got to get back down again to get food and shelter. It's here all the time, it lives here. It's really the very spirit of the Cairngorms. This is the rooftop of Britain. I feel like some golden eagle looking down on half of Scotland stretched below. It's a view Adam Watson has grown up with. I've been here before, but I could have no better hill guide today. I see a long way now, as we get to the corner here. In fact, uh, you can see right down Glen Shee there, look. Oh, see yes. the Shee winding away down. Yeah. And away down into central Scotland there, away on the left, you've got the West Lomond Hill and Fife. And beyond that again, you can just make out another line of hills. That's beyond Edinburgh. Just a pity it wasn't a bit warmer, isn't it? Middle of July, my nose is about to drop off with cold. Well, you can get cold weather like this any month of the year here. And, of course, this is, a, in a way, a, a little bit of the Arctic we're in now. Now I know why you wear the hat, of course, because there seems a lot of heat goes out of your head, and yours is superb for this kind of thing. Oh, yes, and if the wind gets up and starts freezing your ears, you can put it down like this, you see, and cover them up. <laughs> Dress for the occasion. In 1956, declining numbers of grouse on the moors gave the landowners cause for concern. Adam was asked to investigate and came up with a surprising conclusion. The main thing that interested us, uh, apart from the applied project of uh, how to increase numbers for the landowners, which we were able to give them, 
was that uh, the grouse proved to be a very interesting bird to look at how animal populations are controlled in nature. You see, the old idea in the past was that the number of animals you got in an area was mainly controlled by things that killed them, like predators or disease or whatever. And one of the things that uh, I found fairly early on was that the grouse controls its own numbers. Since then, Adam and his team have developed their theories and bring ever more sophisticated equipment to their research. This is a radio receiver designed to pick up signals transmitted by a radio attached to a hen grouse on the hill. Yeah, I'm picking her up. Each year, Adam locates and counts the number of grouse chicks born in a given locality. We're lucky we're picking it up at all with this dark day. With the radio pinpointing an area, the dogs take over. It can be a drawn-out search. Then, as Adam moves in, the chicks fly off. Steady, steady, steady! It's a greyhound. Steady, 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 Anna! Here, come! What Adam's studies have shown is that the grouse is a territorial steady. bird and that its numbers rise and fall Ready. in cycles. Ready. Get down. Get down. Oh, I got it. Good dogs. Good dogs. Good dogs. Steady. Steady now. Steady. 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 Well, Adam, yeah. I thought you'd never ever find one after <laughs> all that running around the moor. Yeah, oh, well, um... These dogs love the thought. Of yeah, it. Uh, this is actually a, a greyhound chick, a black grouse, not a red grouse. Mm -hmm. So different species and much more uncommon, so this is your lucky day. Goodness me. Yeah. How old is this one, then, now? Uh, it'd be about two and a half to three weeks old. I mean, it flew quite strongly, as you saw. Yes. Is it the only one? That it, only uh, chick well, around? there might be more up there, but, of course, when one flew, I, I immediately ran. And I uh, saw so it came in behind this little clump of heather, and so the, the dogs got the smell of it mm -hmm. as soon as they came round. Come on here, look, look, look at this. Look. Why is it different from the red grouse, Adam? What is the, the difference? Well, the, the adults are much bigger, and the, the cock is completely black and white with a, a sort of lyre shaped tail. The hen is brown in colour, like a red grouse, uh, but much bigger. And this chick uh, is a bit like a red grouse, but it's much more barred feathering oh, here, you oh, see. see it's still got quite a lot of down, but uh, they see the feathering, the barred feathering here as well, yes, on I the see. wings. I see. Judging by the amount of time we took to find this, it seems as though there's not too many grass on this hill here. No, no, the, the numbers are going down, and they're having a bad year for breeding this year. A lot of them don't have any chicks at all. What is it that's causing them to go down here? Well, we think that the... Uh, uh, well, there are two things, really. One is that the food was, the heather food, which okay. you see here, was very brown in the late winter. But also, the birds have been high in numbers for a few years and are now going down. We ex expected it would start to get poor. And uh, quite a number of the grouse have chicks this year, but small, two, three, four, instead of maybe six, seven, eight, which it is in a good year. But as Adam Watson is obsessed by these hills and the creatures who live here, it's an obsession he's passed on to his son, who has a particular fascination for the more macabre secrets these hills contain. During the war, many aircraft piloted by young trainees trying to find their way to the airstrips of Lossiemouth, Kinloss, Arbroath and Montrose were lost in the mist-shrouded hills. Young Adam Watson has pinpointed the location of almost every plane that crashed. It's uh, essential to use map and compass and weather like this uh, to save yourself from getting lost. How often do you set off looking for planes when it is like this anyway? Not very often. Uh, I usually need to find the location of the wreckage, so uh, a clear day is the best for it. Here we are. Do you know, I never quite expected to see it in such good condition. Aye, it's, it's quite impressive, isn't it? This is what? 
It's uh, Miles Master, which was uh, a very fast, uh, advanced two-seat pilot trainer. Very fast for its day and quite an advanced uh, design as well. It matched the speed, almost, of the Hurricane and Spitfire, mm. the aircraft it was designed to be the trainer for. What's that speed? What kind of speed are you talking about? That's about 200 miles an hour. Mm. Uh, when did it crash? It was uh, on the 9th of October, 1941, um, in weather probably very much like this, I would think. Uh, low cloud. Um, he clipped the top of Clough de Ben, the very distinctive hilltop, which is that direction, a kilometre, <laughs> into the murk. And uh, they found parts of the wing over there, and he'd travelled this distance from there to here, about a kilometre, out of control and just mushed into the hillside. What was it that got you interested in tracking down the planes in the first place? It was, uh, basically, it goes way back to um, the influence of my dad, because he's had me out in the hills walking around since I was tiny, uh, <laughs> long before I can remember. What do you think his greatest quality is? Can I ask you that? Uh, <laughs> I think his greatest quality, as far as um, his work is concerned, is his love for his work, really. Uh, objectively speaking, I've seen very few people who are uh, so much involved in their work, in their leisure time. I mean, his idea of uh, leisure is going to walk out in the hills. He does it during the week and gets paid for it as well. <laughs> so, um, he, he doesn't like being behind the desk. I think he, he likes to be out in the field and roaming about. <laughs> Adam is a man fascinated with all things Highland. Another of his projects is tracking down and taping the last remnants of the Gaelic language here on Royal D side. You'll only hear the language spoken now as a native tongue in the Outer Isles. Above Balmoral lives crofter Rob Bain, a great source of information on the language and the culture of Bremar. His mother, Jean, was the last Gaelic speaker in this part of Scotland. The language finally died with her just two years ago. I remember you said uh, the last year or two when she was in hospital and she was, wasn't fit any longer to stay at the army. Aye. She was, she was uh, speaking in Gaelic she to the nurses. Nothing else. She wouldn't have, She spoke nothing else, very little else. After she end. became a kind of you can dawdled, she aye, aye. seemed to go back and back. And she, just, she was lucky there was a, an islander there. She, good manager, she understood what she was saying, you know. She spoke la steady aye, on. Aye. Know, she yabbled on in garlic. She was a tremendous uh, fund of information, not just about the Bremar Gaelic, but about the way of life of the old people and about superstitions that they had. For instance, I remember her coming up here about this time of year, and we heard a cuckoo... Uh, singing in the wood there and this brought back to mind an old superstition which she'd heard as a young girl that it was unlucky to waken up in the morning and hear the cuckoo before you'd had breakfast so you, she used to take a piece of old bread to her bed at night and as soon as she woke up in the morning she'd have a quick chew at this uh, before the cuckoo <laughs> oh, could call I see. I see. The interesting thing about uh, place names is that they sometimes tell you something about the identity of the, the people and the culture of the people, and that's important too. And for instance, if I meet uh, somebody like Rob Bain, and I say to him, well, I've been over the Stonyaric Road today, Rob, instantly there's some recognition, some identity that I share with him. That name's not in the map, but he knows where it is, and so do I. What was your earliest memory as a as a kiddie? Can you can you put your mind far back to remember that? <laughs> I can I can tell you a story about that, but that doesn't concern me. There's a lot told me the other day <laughs> that he didn't just exactly remember being born, but he remembered hearing the dog barking when the doctor went away. <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't know whether to believe him or no, but uh, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> 
<laughs> Did it surprise you that people like Adam get so wrapped up in something that is going and dying? And well, not really. I mean, the one could understand them wanting to keep a record of it, you know. No, I was not. I was surprised at the time, but no kennin' what I do now, you can. Ah, oh, he's a decent lad, Adam. <laughs> no, but that was lads going about. <laughs> oh, I. That is worse. No, oh, I. Ah, he's a decent enough lad, Adam. He's got a thing I about think. the hills. He's got a thing oh, about I. the hills. He's a hell man. He's, he's like me. He's more than half wild. Man arose in the countryside, evolved in the countryside, and needs wild nature. And I think that uh, any civilization which oversteps that and tries to dominate the environment has the seeds of its own destruction in it. You know, man is part of the environment, and it's quite a vulnerable part, as we see with pollution, acid rain, and this sort of thing. But I think beyond that, something in our spirit needs wild places and needs to look at natural beauty. But these soft, melting hills can conceal white, icy wastes, even in the height of summer. Why is it that it's here in the middle of July? Because it's quite warm and sheltered in this part of the hill, isn't it? Yes, well, it's because it's sheltered. The snow blows off the top of the hill and the plateau's higher up mm -hmm. because of the gales. And uh, it blows in the wind and comes to rest just in relatively sheltered pockets like this. Mm -hmm. See, you've got a steep hole in the hillside here, and it fills up with snow. And that's why it's here even in July. It'll be here for weeks yet, well into August. You've always been interested in, in snow as a boy, haven't you, Adam? I remember being fascinated by snow even before I became interested in the hills and wrote to Seton Gordon. And I can remember uh, way back, it must have been when I was about six or seven in Tariff, uh, looking at snow out the window, out of the bedroom window, or out of other windows in the house, any time it was snowing, and watching the, the snow falling and the, the snowflakes and the different patterns as the wind caught it, watching it piling up even to see how deep it was. And uh, then later on when I started going to the hills, uh, I was fascinated by the variety of it. And of course the Eskimos have 40 different words to describe snow. I mean, we say, talk about powder snow or granular snow, but they have 40 actually different words to describe it, and so have the laps. I soon discovered that the icy grip of winter can seize you even on the warmest summer day and makes you understand how treacherous the Cairngorms can be. One of the reasons why the Cairngorms are dangerous is that they're so smooth and gentle. Most mountains are peaks. And this means you can quite quickly get into shelter by dropping to lower altitude. But the Cairngorms are very smooth, high, rounded mountains with great plateaus on top. The biggest area of high land in Britain. And a long way from houses and no trees. And this means that if you're caught in a storm there, it's very featureless terrain. And unless your navigation's good, uh, people can very easily get lost. And with drifting snow and gales, they can quickly die of exposure. Adam Watson has experienced the Cairngorms in all their moods. He's a mountain rescue expert and has been scathing about those who risk their own lives, but especially the lives of those in their care on the mountains in winter. It was in November 1971 uh, when uh, the worst tragedy it's ever, ever before a party in the mountains in Britain, when a party of six Edinburgh schoolchildren uh, died in the snow. They decided to, with an instructor, to uh, head out to a place in the plateau to, to head for a hut which existed at that time and spend the night in it. And it was a period when there was snow on the ground. So it was a really a very foolish decision to take children there at, at all in the winter. I, I wouldn't take my own children there in the winter. Of 
called in as the expert witness. It must have been very trying for the parents of the children involved to hear you stand up there and say, presumably, that these children could have survived if they'd done the right thing. Yes, yes, I remember sharing a hotel room with the father of one of the children who died, and uh, I felt quite angry at the time that that was a needless death. Do you ever fear anything when you're alone in the hills? Because, in one sense, you're, you're preaching a gospel that you don't follow yourself, because you come alone here and you walk and you experience very bad weather. Yes I, do it. yes, I like coming alone. I like coming in company as well, but some of the best days I've ever had in the Cairngorms have been on my own in the winter, on skis, and uh, often uh, not telling people where I've gone. I mean, that's another rule that I, I've broken often. Uh, where you're supposed to leave a message saying where you've gone. You see, I think that if you go on your own steam and you've had experience, you're not trying to beat the mountains. You'll come off if you notice the weather getting bad. In fact, you're much more aware of the weather if you are alone. And uh, you know that if you haven't told anybody, then uh, nobody's going to come and look for you. I think if people felt the way they do if you're on an Arctic expedition, that if you make a mistake, you're going to die, then it would be a lot safer in the hills. very religious person? I am religious in the sense that I appreciate the beauty of nature and in that sense I suppose I'm deeply religious. You know, I, I wonder about it and you get some kind of inspiration from that and if you have worries they just fade away. This is the one part of your life perhaps that's almost tempered the other part of your life, the professional side of your life. Yes, to me I think it's the most important part. It's the place I first fell in love with, and um, it's, uh, it's been my mistress all the way along, and still is. Next week, Selina meets the American folk singer who bought a barony in Aberdeenshire. That's at the same time next Monday. been said that Britain is a raft of coal floating in a sea of oil and natural gas. Bit of an exaggeration? Well, yes, I suppose it is. But we must admit that Britain has the largest energy resources of any country in the European community.